Someone's going with my wife, and that's okay. That's awesome. Turn your Bibles, please, to Galatians 5, whatever media that's in. I want to thank Stephen for helping us on guitar and Clifford for our AV. Um, Shannon as well for our opening service. And I want to thank my wife. Look, I, I know it's my wife, and I'm supposed to say thankfulness, but I'm also putting on my pastor church planter hat and say that my wife, week in and weeks out, week, out, week in and week out, takes our little ones and has a prepared story for them from God's word that is accessible to them. And so I hope you'll uh, take some time to say thank you. Again, I know I'm wearing my husband, pastor, church planner hat at the same time, but I hope you do that. And um, one last thing before I, I, I begin. Um, someone came out here. Did Glenn come out? With, so Shannon's husband, Glenn, he's under the weather today. He came out. And like I normally come up here and blow off the leaves in the morning this time of year. It takes a little time, but I came up here and the leaves were gone. And there are gazillions of them here. Um, and and the, the parking lot was blown off and the walkway. So if you see Glenn later on, tell him thank you. Um, I, I bet he has great joy doing that, just strapping on the leaf blower and tuning out this old world. Um, but I, I hope you'll thank him for that. We are in um, Galatians 5, and goodness my, I better get there. This is our last sermon in this series on the fruit of the Spirit. And if I can confess something, I'm a little bit... Uh, a little bit sad this morning. You know how when you went to when you college um, and you had to say goodbye to your college buddies, at least for the summer? That's what I feel like. We've been in here for nine weeks. This is the ninth week. And I, I feel sad that we're going to say goodbye. We'll be going into an Advent series. And then, Lord willing, this spring we'll dive into the book of Matthew. And then do some summertime in the Psalms. Um, that gets us through the next uh, nine months or so. But... Um, I'm, I'm a little sad. This has been good to us. Um, the reason I picked this for our first sermon series is because I want the people of North Augusta Fellowship to be known as people who are characterized by the fruit of the Spirit. No small task I've set for us. No small task. And so I hope we can, um, we see these fruits born up in us over and over again over the next few weeks. So let me read Galatians 5. 13 through 25, we'll pray, and then we'll, we'll get after it. Hear not God's word. For you were called to freedom, brothers, only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. For the whole law is fulfilled in one word. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. But if you bite and devour one another, watch out that you are not consumed by one another. But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the desires of the flesh are against the Spirit, and the desires of the Spirit are against the flesh. For these are opposed to each other, to keep you from doing the things you want to do. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are evident. Sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger. Rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. I warn you, as I warned you before, that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires, if we live by the Spirit, let's, let us also keep in step with the Spirit. The Word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, as we approach this passage of Scripture, this one last time on our Sunday morning, we ask that you would meet with us. Um, this is your Word that you preserved for a long time. Um, and it is an awesome thing. It is awe filled to approach the word of the living God. Let us do so, Father, with proper sincerity, but let us also do so in anticipation that, that you will refresh our souls, that you'll bring good news to our ears. We need it this morning, Father. 
And that as you delight in us, we will delight in you. We pray these things in, Christ, in the name of Christ Jesus, our Lord. Amen. In the late uh, 19th and early 20th century, the temperance movement gained some steam. And it was, it was fueled by a couple of factors. Uh, number one, the rise of the Industrial Revolution meant we needed workers in a factory operating heavy machinery. And one of the skills that we needed for those workers was to be sober. It didn't do um, very good to be drunk around heavy machinery. But there was an also another cultural moment at play there. And it was the events of the Second Great Awakening and the ramifications arriving from revivalism. Both in the 18th and the 19th centuries, they're swept across parts of the nations, a revival. Um, and folks would, itinerant evangelists would travel around from different denominations and have open outdoor meetings. And um, a host of good things came from them, a host of not good things. But one of those that, that arose out of it was the idea of temperance and, and abstinence from imbibing in alcoholic beverages. Um, this, of course, led to prohibition, what we know from 1920 to 33, and brought us such characters as the mob. Elliot Ness from the Untouchables, etc. In fact, during one time of revival in a Rochester, New York area, a pledge of complete abstinence was required to receive salvation. That's how far the temperance movement had gone. We're again in our last fruit of the Spirit this morning. The King James Version translates it temperance. We read in our ESV this morning, self control. And this morning, I want to go a little bit out of order. Normally, we would do what the fruit of the Spirit this has its foundations in the Old Testament, what it is, what it isn't, and finally how the good news comes forward. But I'm going to switch that around a little bit. We're going to flip the order. And first of all, I'm going to talk about what it isn't. And, and we've talked about, again, we reviewed that this fruit of the Spirit is gradual. It is internal, it is inevitable, and it is symmetrical. Gra gradual, internal, inevitable, symmetrical. But what is it not? Self-control is not stuffing, and I don't mean the kind that you're going to get here in a few days. It's not cramming your emotions down. It's not stuffing it in. It's not the absence of emotions. No, emotions were given to us by God, and they are part of the fact that we are created in the image of God. Our emotions are to be enjoyed and stewarded just as our minds and our body. Emotional health is as important as physical and spiritual health. And as the Apostle Paul says elsewhere, our bodies and the rest of us are temples of the Holy Ghost. It is not the absence of fun or joy. Again, the list of the fruit of the Spirit earlier, among other items, proves that it is not the absence of fun or joy. We have been given many gifts, many gifts by our wonderful Creator to enjoy them as He has intended them. And we engage in deficiency just as we engage in excess to our own detriment. I'll say that one more time. We engage in deficiency as well as excess to our own detriment. What it is not uh, for the Galatians, they were tempted at this time to engage in self-expression and self-actualization through a variety of means. And we'll get to that in just a minute. But what is it then? If it's not stuffing, if it's not the absence of emotions, if it's not poor emotional behavior, it's not the absence of fun or joy, then what is it? Well, there's many definitions, and they all are similar. The New Testament word is engratia. I know you wanted that because we've been saying every Greek word through the whole series. It's the ability to deny ourselves the indulgence of our sinful desires, even when no one is looking. It's the ability to deny ourselves the indulgence of our sinful desires, even when no one can see us. If we could put it in a little more corporate way, it's the ability to pursue the important over the urgent, rather than to be always impulsive and uncontrolled. After all, 
isn't that the mark of maturity in a, in a human physically? Like, aren't we trying to train our children and our loved ones when they're younger, our students? Hey, a delayed gratification. Don't be impulsive. Think through things. We even have a term for it. Sleep on it. Sleep on it. Don't engage in impulse and uncontrolled desires. Don't pursue... Uh, don't pursue the urgent over the important. It's self-control that leads to self-mastery. And, and I want to stop there and ask um, several questions. What does this look like? Does that description characterize you? Could it be said of you that in your emotions you, you pursue the important rather than the urgent. Are you marked um, by a means of delayed gratification? A little more deep down diagnosis, we could ask, what do you over desire? What do you desire that's good, but that's too good? Work, for instance, work is a good thing, but being a workaholic on the one hand or being lazy on the other is not good. Being in a relationship, in a meaningful relationship with someone is good. Pursuing that person too much and putting all your cares and hopes and dreams into one person is not. On the same level, are you under-desiring the right things? Things like the glory of God, the success of His church, or your own Christ likeness. And if we diagnose ourselves with these things, we have to admit that we come up short. I bet all of us this week has perhaps lost our temper. We've said um, an animated word to someone or something about someone. We've said something colorful, thought something colorful. Perhaps we've overeaten. Perhaps we've overindulged or self-controlled in one of these uh, works of the flesh, as it says in verse 19. Impurity, sensuality, enmity, jealousy, fits of anger. And again... This is, there's nothing new under the sun. We can look at a snapshot of, of our world and watch the 24-hour infotainment news cycle and we can say, oh, things are bad. But again, there's nothing new under the sun. The Galatians were going through the same thing. Sexuality, impurity, fits of outrage. You can look at other letters that Paul's written to his church. You can find things like a guy sleeping with his mother-in-law. Things like that. There's nothing new under the sun. I know, I've said that three times. But it really is. Like the same items that the Christians in the church at Galatia were dealing with, we're dealing with the exact same things. Have we indulged ourselves too much in something bad? Have we under-desired or under-pursued something good? These are all items we need to think about. Are we envious of someone? Are we jealous of their success? Do we need to step on them to climb up the ladder? Have we, have we engaged in drunkenness and not just come under the influence of alcohol, but under the influence of something else, like a worldly philosophy, or comfort, the pursuit of comfort, or anger, or rage? Are we at odds with someone for no reason at all? These are the things that the Lord expects of us. And he says, the fruit of the Spirit is self-control. It's the ability to deny ourselves the indulgence of our sinful desires, even when no one can see us. It's the ability to pursue uh, the important over the urgent. How do, how do we go about this? What do we need to think about? Well, in the 12th book of the Odyssey, as Odysseus is leaving Kirk's Island, Kirk informs Odysseus of the dangers of the sea that he will encounter on the way home. And one of the items of the sea that he specifically warns about, about is the sirens. And no, not the ones on our local fire department or police vehicles or, or ambulances. No, these sirens in this story are beautiful women of the sea who sing songs from the shore that hypnotize and lure the sailors in. And they end up, and they end up being tricked and their ships are wrecked on the boats and they die in a wild grave because they can't resist songs. So Odysseus does something. He instructs his crew 
to tie him to the mast, telling them to ignore whatever he says. These men also subsequently put beeswax in their ears so they can't hear anything. And then tie Odysseus to the mast. Odysseus is the only one on the boat who can hear these siren songs. But you know what he can't do? He can't steer the ship into the rocks. The others usually are covered. Odysseus can do nothing. And the sirens are ignored. And the ship is safe. What is one thing we need to do to foster self-control? And I want to say this. Um, that not just for self-control, but all these fruits of the Spirit. Do you know what it means to come under the control of the Holy Spirit? Do you know what that means? It means to listen to them. I'm sorry, to listen to Him. To listen to the Holy Spirit. How do you know what the Holy Spirit is saying? Because the Holy Spirit, one of His jobs is to bring to mind the words of Jesus Christ. That's what Jesus said would happen when the Holy Spirit would come. And look, I, I know this is an easy application, but I want to ask us, not necessarily how much time we are in the Word, but how much we are in God's Word. And not just how much are we in God's Word, but how much is God's Word in us? One of the things the Holy Spirit is going to do, the more time and the more in-depth you are in God's Word, is He's going to bring that to mind. Get in a sticky situation, the Holy Spirit will bring God's truth to your mind. He's going to bring it to your mind. And again, I'll readily admit, it's an easy application here. Just go read your Bible. Yes, and I know we're in different stages of life. We're not in college anymore when we read two hours a day for some of us. I remember those times. We have jobs and kids and responsibilities. But as I say about prayer, I do say about our Bible reading, we have time to do it. And this little thing right here proves we do. We're going to come to the end of days and get a screen time report. Not really. But if we did, it would prove to us that we had time to be in God's Word. And I'm not saying that we need to get up at 3 a.m. and read for two hours. I'm just saying that perhaps it's time when we're scrolling that we could be reading or meditating or thinking on God's Word. But I want to put it in this perspective, too. It's much more foundational. This self-control is much more foundational. And I want to go back to the Old Testament for this. Do you remember... Do you remember one of the first commands that God gave Adam and Eve? What did he tell them? He said, hey, look, Adam, Eve, I'm going to put you in this garden. And what I want you to do, I want you to be fruitful, multiply, subdue the earth, and have dominion over it. That's the King James translation. Yes, I know that, that word dominion is a bit harsh. It may seem in our lingo. But it has the idea of stewardship, of management of causing this garden to flourish. That was what Adam was to do. We could say this, the first, the first garden we are to tend to is ourselves. The first way we obey the cultural mandate to steward the earth is to A, steward ourselves. We are the first vineyard that needs to be attended to. This, having self-control and tending to the well-being of our souls and our minds and our emotions is part of being made in God's image. My youngest just turned four. Believe it or not, she has times where she's not controlled. We somehow, we, we, I shouldn't say we expect it, but we know it's coming from a four-year-old. But it's different from a 44-year-old. We don't expect it from that person. We might expect these types of behavior from someone who, says, someone who says, Hey, I don't follow Jesus. We shouldn't expect it from someone who says, Yes, Jesus is Lord. And as God's people made in God's image, furthermore, as people who have been united to Christ, the, the original cultural mandate applies to us and we say, subdue yourself. Have dominion over it. Tend it. Care for it. Steward it well. 
have self-control. This idea that self-control leads to self-mastery. And it also applies to this. So let me go one step further. It also entails the mastery of one's craft. Self-control comes into your work. We talk a good bit about faith and work in here. God cares about your work. He's created work. He's created you for work. It's the fall that has brought in frustration. But did you know that attending to your own craft, attending to your own vocation, and being the best that you can be at it is a matter of self-control and subduing the earth and having the meaning of it. God cares for your vocation. We say the three M's around here in this area, right? Military, medical, manufacturing. Sometimes we add a fourth one, mom. Obviously there are others. But whatever God has called to you, whether it's blue collar, white collar, or no collar, God says part of self-control is mastering your own craft. Whether it's in the home, in the office, in the plant, at school, students, this goes for you well. Your stewardship of your studies is a matter of self-control. So how do we do this? Right, I think God has a sense of humor because he left self-control for the last one. You might have gotten through some of these and thought, okay, love, I like that one, I can do that. Joy, yes, I like being happy. Sign me up. Gentleness, yeah, I, I can calm down. Faithfulness, yep, I, I, I think I can do the committed. Self-control, complete train wreck. Complete train wreck. When we, when we come to this one, self-control of Jesus Christ. Here's a person who is fully God and fully man. God himself, the Son of God, come in human flesh, and as the creator of everything, he had access to it all. You know what Jesus could have done? He could have come and said, guys, you want to see miracles? Look what I can do. And done something and said, hey, give me all your money. He could have come and said, hey, Pharisees, Sadducees, you're opposing me. You're gone. Bye-bye. But he didn't do that. Think of the control that Jesus had with his own disciples. If you read about the disciples pre-resurrection, you think this is a clown show. These guys are always doing some knuckleheaded thought or word or activity. And Jesus is kind. He's in control. He's patient them. Jesus' life is an example of self-control that we couldn't gain for ourselves. But it is also, it also ensures a self-controlled life that we could not gain for ourselves. Jesus' death, that means that we have died to our sin. We have died to self-expression. We have died to self-actualization that this world calls us to. Jesus' death, that means all the time we lost control. All the times we yelled at our spouse. All the times we yelled at our kid. All the time we yelled at that word that had to be censored in our car at the guy who cut us off. Every time that sin was nailed to Jesus' cross. We don't have to bear it. Jesus' life of self-control, even when he was sweating great drops of blood in the garden, means that gets credited to us because we are united to him. See, it would be easiest for us to say, hey, go out of here this week and white-knuckle this thing. Yeah, I know you're going to be with some tricky relatives. The, the tryptophan from the turkey is going to flow. You might be a little lubed up. But there's better news. There's better news than a white knuckled get after it. Oh yes, Jesus calls us to pursue these things. But he pursues us, one, by the power of the Holy Spirit. He calls us to pursue them, two, because our sin has been nailed to the cross. We don't have to bear it anymore. We are no longer under its power. And three, he makes sure that we are validated by, by the Father because he has earned a life of self-control for us. And one day he's coming back 
and all loss of self-control will be gone when he makes all things new. My friend, you may think that um, this fruit of the Spirit in general and the, the self-control in particular mean that we, we, need, to, um, we need to not desire. But I, I come back to this quote from C.S. Lewis in The Weight of Glory. It, seem, it would seem that our Lord finds our desires not too strong, but too weak. We are half-hearted creatures fooling about with drink and sex and ambition when infinite joy is offered us. Like an ignorant child who wants to go on making mud pies in a slum because he cannot imagine what is meant by the offer of a holiday at the sea. We are far too easily pleased. And so I, I urge you, my friends, do not be far too easily pleased by this world's calling you to a pursuit of self-actualization, but rather go after the infinite joy that is offered us by Jesus Christ in the fruit of the Spirit. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we, you, you have an uncanny way of obliterating our self-righteousness. You, you have a pointed way of saying that at the end of the day, we need Jesus. We need someone else to do this all for us. We need someone to motivate us and empower us, and you've given us this Holy Spirit. And so, Lord, might we be people who are marked by self-control, who desire not too little, and who, who do not desire less than the good things you've given us. Father, it's hard to be self-controlled. Let us be controlled by the power of your Holy Spirit, we pray. We ask these things not only for the, the, the fruit of self-control, but for the rest of the fruits of the Spirit. Lord, again, bring this word back to our heart by your Holy Spirit this week.